Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we are so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. David, we are still getting feedback from folks about our podcast episode with our friend Emily Lay. People absolutely love that episode. And it's no surprise because that Emily Lay is a delight. She is. She is so enjoyable. And the work she is doing in this world is so enjoyed by countless folks. Including us. I love my Simplified Planner. And I love telling folks about Emily and introducing them to her products. Not only is Emily the queen of organization with her popular Simplified Planner, she's also the creator of other incredible products to help you simplify your life. And she's a children's book author. How does she do it all? I think I know the secret. She probably uses her Simplified Planner to keep track of all of her incredible work and her family life. (laughs) You must be right. 2023 is right around the corner, and I know I want my year to be the most peacefully productive yet. Sounds like you need another Simplified Planner for the new year. Yes, I do. Join me over at emilylay.com and use my code RAISING15 for 15% off your purchase at Simplified. Again, that's emilylay.com, and my code is RAISING15. Sally Lloyd-Jones is a New York Times best-selling, award-winning children's book writer. Her writing has been critically acclaimed by the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, including her mega bestseller, The Jesus Storybook Bible. Sally was born and raised in Africa, schooled in England, and at the Sorbonne in Paris, and now lives in New York City. We are so thrilled to share this rich conversation with you. Make sure to listen to the end because we have a sweet surprise for you. Sally, it is a joy and an honor for us to have you on this podcast. We just have loved your work for so many years. And David and I speak all over the country to parents. And I think every single seminar, we talk about the Jesus Storybook Bible. Oh, we wow. We cannot say enough about the truth. And every time David always introduces it and he says, how many of you all have read the Jesus Storybook Bible? And, you know, of course, 99% of the people in the room raise their hands. <laughs> and then he says, how many of you cry every time you read the Jesus Storybook Bible? We both raise our hands yes. too with everyone. It's just beautiful. It thank is. you for your work. Well, thank you. That's wonderful to hear. You have made the scripture come to life in such a beautiful and poignant way. And would you talk about how you created it, how it started, how the idea formed? Well, to tell you that, I'm going to tell you a story of how I was one time watching someone do scrimshaw, which is the engraving people do on whale teeth and ivory. And this guy was doing it and he had a big like eyeglass and he was all scrunched over it. And it was tiny. I said, how long does something like that take? And he looked up and he thought about it a minute. And then he went, oh, probably about 40 years and 10 hours. <laughs> Whoa. In other words, his whole life. Wow. So you can say, literally, it took me a year to write the book, but really it's my whole life. Mm. And anyone knows that in whatever they're doing, that it's not the actual time, it's the complete thing that makes you who you are, that out of that comes whatever God's called you to do. So my childhood, I have another memory. I became a Christian when I was about four. My dad led me to the Lord in a wonderful way. So I knew from the very beginning that Jesus was my best friend, Mm. but I wasn't quite so sure about God because I would read these stories like David and Goliath, which of course is a very exciting story, except if you think that you're supposed to be brave like David. Mm. And as a little girl, I would think, well, I never would be brave enough to fight a giant, so I'm not doing it right. So God must not be pleased with me because he wants me to be like David. Mm. So God must not love me. How can he? I'm not doing it right. And because I had got this idea that God was some kind of hard taskmaster and I'm supposed to be a hero. So that was something, even though I grew up in a Christian home, I somehow had this idea that, you know, Jesus was lovely and God wasn't so nice. Mm. You know, I went to a Sunday school when I was about six that I remember 
And I'm sure they all meant very well. And who knows what they really were saying because a six-year-old will take whatever they, you know, but right. I was a dreamy child. So I wasn't particularly at the top of my class or anything. I was always staring out of the window. But not only did I have that at school, but then I'd go to church and in the Sunday school, I'd get the same impression that I wasn't doing it right. So my impression was it was all rules and coloring inside the lines and I wasn't good enough. And so as a six-year-old, I remember saying to myself, when I grow up, I'm never going to church again. Mm -hmm. So something went very wrong. And all of that to say, I sort of in some ways credit that Sunday school with why the Jesus Storybook Bible came to be, because I had such a burning passion that children should know that God loves them. And it's not about them trying to be good so he'll love them. It's because he's good and he loves them. And out of his love for them, then their life will change. Mm. I wanted children to know that they were loved, first of all, by the God who did everything to come to be with them and moved heaven and earth so that he could be close to them. So that was my passion behind writing the book. And so I think it was my whole life leading me from when I was very little through that Sunday school to know that I wish there was a book that I could have read as a six-year-old that would have told me the truth that, yes, our lives are are to reflect him, but that can't be the first thing. Otherwise, why would Jesus have come? Mm. Jesus had to come because we were powerless. And the whole story of the Bible is not this condemning rule book that tells me how wrong I am or heroes I'm supposed to copy. It's nothing about that. It's about the story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. Then it's a love story. And it's a wonderful rescue story. And it's a story about a hero. And it's so much more than what we sometimes get the impression that it's some kind of moral lesson. Mm. So that's the long answer to your question. I guess it took all of my life. That is a beautiful answer to the question. Sure I feel like is. I just am breathing deeper just hearing you talk. Mm. Sally, thank you. Well, I'm, and it's also encouraging, I think, for anyone to think it's all grace and mm. God equips you for what he calls you to do. Yes. And it's all of your life that's going into it. So you sort of can, can relax and follow the clues because they'll be there. Yes, relax and follow the clues. Great wisdom. Yes. Sally, you are also the author of Known, Found, Goldfish on Vacation, Thoughts to Make Your Heart Sing, Song of the Stars, and countless others. Mm -hmm. What do you love most about writing for children? Well, I think they're the best readers ever <laughs> because they'll go with you. Their imagination is just amazing. But hand in hand with that, it's a great honor to write for children, but it's also a great responsibility because they're younger. It's a double-edged sword. So I think what I love about writing for children is the joy and the humor and the imagination. They'll go with you on all of that. And at the same time, it's a great responsibility and it demands our best work. Another passion of mine is when I get the impression that people think, well, they're just children, so anything will do. And you see that reflected in all kinds of ways where people think, well, you know, anyone can write a children's book. Well, I heard a wonderful professor of children's writing say once, yes, it's very easy to write a bad picture book. Mm. And I think that's what I would say is children deserve our best work. Mm. Writing a children's book is not easy. It demands your best work, just like writing for an adult does. And that's not to puff myself up. It's just more that we need to really respect children and realize because they're younger, it's all the more important that they have the best work that you can give them. Yes. Sally, one of my favorite experiences of my entire life is that I went to Regent College in Vancouver and took a week-long class on writing from Lucy Shaw and Madeline Langle. Oh, my word. When Madeline, <laughs> I know, it was amazing. And you know, you sound so much like Madeline Lingle. Not your voice necessarily, but that is no. exactly what she talked about when she talked about writing A Wrinkle in Time mm -hmm. and writing for kids. It's so much of the same truth. Oh, well, she was a master. Yes. I yes. think it's true in all of areas of life that we need to respect children. And who led us in that was Jesus, wasn't he? Mm. I think we go very wrong when we think because they're small that somehow they don't count. Mm. The truth is our best position before a child is on our knees eye to eye, not standing up and speaking down to them. It's more getting on their level and learning because we can learn so much from them, can't we? Yes. Their simple, straightforward trust. Mm. Yes. Well, will you tell us a little bit about your newest book, Known? 
Oh, thank you. Yes, it's in my series, which they're padded board books and they're geared for the very tiniest ones. Mostly they're paraphrases of Psalms. I mean, one of them is actually the Lord's Prayer, but Mm. all of the others, we've got known, loved, near, found, Mm. which is Psalm 23. So known is Psalm 139 part of it, because to be known but not loved is awful, obviously. Or to be loved but not known is awful as well. But what we all long for is to know that we're known and we're loved. Mm. And that's what this book, because it's from Psalm 139, where it's all about God made you and he knows everything about you and he loves you completely. And I wanted children to put it into words that little tiny ones could understand that God is intimately familiar with them and he loves them and they can talk to him and he'll listen to them and he wants to hear from them. And he knows their name. He knows the color of their eyes. He knows the dreams inside their heart. He knows everything about them because he made them. So it's really a book of comfort for little tiny ones. And it's got such beautiful illustrations by Jago, who did the Jesus Storybook Bible. Yes, It follows a little boy and his dad through what, to me, I think is New York City, a day in New York City. So it's beautiful. He's done a wonderful job. Well, I have an eight-month-old nephew. I'm going to buy that today for Christmas. So thank you. Oh, thank you. David, have I told you lately how much Henry is loving the Explorer Bible I gave him? Have you been doing some of the online activities with the QR codes we love? Yes, he loves those interactive activities, and they turn our reading into an experience. I was talking with a little guy the other day about using his big words dictionary to look up the big words he finds in the Bible. What a great idea. I love it when kids get invested in Bible study, even if it's through something as simple as looking up big words. And that's what's so great about the Explorer Bible for kids. It has so many helpful tools baked right there in the Bible. Fun facts and explanations of big concepts. It's the perfect first full-text Bible when kids are ready to graduate out of their storybook Bibles. And did you know that Henry said he's already ready to graduate out of picture Bibles at the age of four? (laughs) So even before they move on from their storybook Bibles, too, like Henry, he already loves the Explorer Bible for kids, and it's a Bible he can grow into in the years to come. I love that. That's why the Explorer Bible makes the perfect gift for a child's dedication or baptism, or birthday. And actually, the new year is around the corner, the perfect time to start a new family Bible reading practice. That's such a great idea. All you have to do is go to lifeway.com and choose from many fun editions of the Explorer Bible. Make sure to use our special code RBG to get 50% off. Buy your Explorer Bible for Kids today at lifeway.com and use code RBG to get 50% off. Sally, when you think about all of your work, what do you hope children and adults will gain from your writing? Well, I've thought about that a lot because you kind of have to keep that in mind, don't you? A wise mentor of mine said, for when the days are hard, you need to remember what took you into the work. And I would just say one word, joy. Mm. That's what I want to bring to children. And if it can bring adults joy as well, that's great. So whether it's joy coming through a, a very, very ridiculous story about the tiniest king that ever lived, Tiny Cedric, Hmm. or it's a Bible story. They're all, to me, all part of just telling a good story and bringing joy and laughter. And I think that comes if you tell the truth. Hmm. Again, if you do your best work, then the joy will come out of it because it's in you, hopefully. Yes. And kids sure know when we're telling the truth. (laughs) They do. That's the other thing, isn't it? They keep us honest. Yes, they They certainly do. do. The other thing I love about children is when you read to them, as you know, if you're boring with your story, they don't mind. They'll just walk away. You know, it's like <laughs> so that's the other thing I'd say to anyone who wants to write children's books or is writing. It's very important to test it on your audience because they will be very honest with you. Yes. And then you'll so know. True. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Well, in our podcast, this season is about raising emotionally strong and worry-free kids based on books that David and I have written. And we'd love to hear about a memory or story from your growing up that helped shape you into who you are. That's such a great question. Well, I went to boarding school when I was eight, which is very young, and people are horrified when they hear that. But the school was such a gift to me. And yes, it was hard. But again, in God's scheme of things, 
that school was where I met the teacher that told me I could write. Mm. It was the most wonderful school that celebrated imagination and it was a perfect school for me. So I can see completely how God's hand was in it, but it was a scary thing for an eight-year-old to be sent away. And my dad gave me Joshua 1, 9, and it says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go. And the thing I love about that is he took me seriously. He prayed with me, gave me that verse. And as an eight-year-old, I took it seriously. I felt like I was Joshua heading off into the mm. promised land. And I was. In God's scheme of things, a little eight-year-old going to boarding school isn't less important than Joshua. So I think it's one of those things where we must take children seriously. They have deep fears and concerns. And instead of him saying to me, now remember to be good, I'm sure he said all that. But if he'd said all of that without the comfort, which is what we tend to do with children, they need our guidance. But in their devotional life, they don't need moral lessons any more than when we sit down to do Bible readings. We don't want to be told what we're supposed to be doing the whole time. We need our eyes lifted up to where our help comes from. We need the center of it to be God's strength. And I think with children, they need comfort. They don't need us telling them what to do the whole time. Mm. It shouldn't be moral lessons because that will just end in despair. Mm. Wow. So I'm so grateful for that verse, which then became a really strengthening thing to me. So I guess that would be what I would say is that if we treat children the way we would, what we would want ourselves when we face difficult things, comfort and truth. It is so interesting to hear you say that. You can imagine in this day and time being therapists with kids, we see a lot of anxiety with kids, which is part of mm -hmm. why we're of wanting to lean into this content. And for you to tell the story, Sally, of being four and hearing about David and feeling this pressure that you have to rise up <laughs> and that that's not what you're capable of to being eight and being sent off to boarding school and hearing about another verse, another scripture saying, be strong and courageous. And the fact that, as you said, it's the love of God that changes us. And whatever your dad did, Obviously, Jesus was significantly and profoundly at work in your heart to make you feel loved enough to embrace that scripture rather than feeling like you had to rise up into it. It says so much about what we can do to help kids experience God's love and how it does change us. That's so true because you're right. Something about that verse didn't feel condemning at all, mm. whereas the story, maybe it's because the application that someone gave David and Goliath was what condemned me yes. at that Sunday school. It was interpretation versus trusting God to speak to the child directly through his word. It was God's word unvarnished that comforted me. Mm. David and Goliath, the story probably wouldn't have done that to me if someone hadn't said it to me. Yes. Mm. So it's letting God's word, because we have to trust that God can speak to his children, whether or not we know what he's saying or not, <laughs> probably none of, none so of our true. business. Yes. You know? Because to me, what that verse did was it told me how important I was and how heroic it was that I was going to school. Mm. And I think that's what God wanted me to know, that it's not an easy thing to do. And he knew, he understood, and he was with me. Mm. I mean, that's really the key of that verse is right. be strong and courageous because I'm with you, not be strong and courageous so I can love you. Mm. That's very different. You can be strong because I'm with you. Mm. That's a comfort. That's not a moral lesson. Indeed it is. Yeah. Sally, along those lines, are there any other things that you think help kids become more emotionally strong and or worry less? My perspective is let them be kids. Mm. Let them run around. And I'm not a parent, but I have nephews and nieces and sisters. And I just think sometimes our fears are what convey fear to children. Yes. So I think our first job in any child, it doesn't have to be your own children. It's are you trusting the Lord is your help? First, are you trusting God with your fears? Because if you're not, then you're going to convey it. Even if you don't say anything, it's going to come across. So I think the first job is focus on what your faith is and trusting the Lord with what you're frightened about so that you don't convey it without even meaning to. Mm. Thank yes, you for that reminder. Great, no, that's what I was thinking. Such great reminders. So as we spend time with kids and spend time with parents, too, in counseling, one of the things we talk so much about is how emotions obviously toss us 
every which way and wanting kids to have foundations of truth to go back to. And you have mentioned so many already as we've been talking, but what would you say is one truth that's really helped you worry less? The late Queen's favorite verse, I think, was, where does my help come from? Mm. Mm. Talking to yourself, and I think David Martin Lloyd-Jones in Spiritual Depression said, are you listening to yourself or are you talking to yourself? We have to talk to ourselves instead of just listening. Oh, that's so good. Mm. I wish I had something I was taking notes, Sally. This is so good. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, the psalmist knows that, doesn't he? Because he's always saying, well, why are you so downcast on my soul? Mm. I will yet put my hope. So if we're just listening to ourselves, and science has caught up, hasn't it? It knows that thoughts are going through our heads all the time. And it's what we do with them. If we entertain them, we can go down a rabbit hole. But if we take our thoughts in hand and remind myself, where does my help come from? Does it come from me having everything together? Does it come from my wallet? Does it come from me writing another book? Does it, you know, fill in the blank, whatever your thing is. No, my help comes from the Lord. Mm who made heaven and earth. For me, it's just constantly giving over the things that want to make me worried. It's a constant thing, isn't it? We're just sheep, so we never remember. But (laughs) (laughs) I like the idea that Martin Lloyd-Jones said, talk to yourself, don't listen to yourself. Me too. We talk often about becoming students of the kids we love and would love to ask you, what is something you've learned from kids in general or a specific child you've had the pleasure of knowing? Well, so much. I mean, anytime I'm with children, I feel like you just can't get enough of what they say. They come up with such amazing things. Mm -hmm. But I think wonder is the thing. Mm -hmm. Wonder is very connected to me, I think, to humility. And children are physically small and weaker. They know it. They don't pretend. They know they're weak and smaller. And I think because of that, they're more filled with wonder about They've got a right-sized view of themselves, whereas we tend to forget because we're still children with God. And anyway, their wonder is what blows me away. That's such a beautiful trait because we get so used to amazing things, you know, just waking up alive or walking down the street and seeing a beautiful tree. I want to stay open to that sort of thing. And children, you know, very little children can be so thrilled with the wrapping paper, can't they? They don't even care about the gift. Yes. So I think that's the thing. I want to grow in wonder. Mm. Mm. Me too. Well, we cannot say enough about your work and your books. And just even talking with you feels like such a confirmation of everything that you're doing and Mm. that you are exactly who we would imagine Mm -hmm. you to be. Wow, we've loved you for so long. Yes, yes. Oh, that's so lovely. Well, I'm so grateful. As you guys know, your work can make you very, you're by yourself working. So it's really nice when you meet fellow travelers and we're all being deployed in different ways. I'm really grateful for your encouragement and thank you for your generosity. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your generosity to all of us. And we'd love for you to tell folks more about where they can learn all the things that you're doing and as you have new books, just how they can keep up with you. Oh, thank you. Well, I have a website, which is myname.com. And I also, probably the best way is to sign up for my newsletter because I send out a newsletter every month and in it give away downloads and free things and also let you know about any new books or we have a podcast for the Jesus Storybook Bible that we've done for now a year and we have all kinds of amazing guests talking about, it's not for children, but what's interesting is teenagers are listening too, but it's very short. It's like 10 minutes. We invite someone on from all different walks of life to talk about how grace and love changed their lives. Mm. And we've had Amy Grant, we've had all kinds of amazing people. So anyway, the best thing would be sign up with my newsletter, which you can find on my website, or I'm also on Instagram. My tag is my name. So those are ways to connect. And we'll link all of that in our show notes as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sally, we like to end with something fun. We talk a lot about food on this podcast. (laughs) Well, that must be why I like you guys. There it is. There it is. And we talk about tacos in particular. We'd love to ask you a two-part question. First, Mm -hmm. would you prefer guacamole or queso? And secondly, what's your favorite taco? See how greedy I am? I came straight in with guacamole. (laughs) We love that. And my favorite taco, I'm going to say it in a really bad way because I have a friend who's Mexican and she just dies laughing whenever I say this, but I'm just going to say it. (laughs) 
because <laughs> I don't know how to say it except the way I say it. So it's barbacoa, but I don't think that's how you say it. But <laughs> You know, that's my British way of saying it, which you probably don't even know what that means. Yes, do we do. do. I don't know how you say it either. That. Oh, yes. How do you say it? No clue. That sounded okay, right good. on. <laughs> it does sound right oh, to me. Your friend would be laughing. after the two of us too. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, I just wanted to also say what a great work you guys do. So I'm grateful for you and how wonderful to have people, like we were saying, taking children seriously and taking their fears and mm. sounds, especially now. So I just wanted to thank you for what you guys do. Mm. Thank you, Sally. You're so kind. Thank you so much for having me. It was lovely chatting with you. It's been a joy to spend time with you. Lovely thank you chatting for doing with you. We hope we it. get to meet you in person one we of these do. days. Oh, I would love that. Yes, one of these days. Yes. Blessings on your Christmas season. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We have a feeling that you are probably like the two of us and wanting to hear her read. And we got up the courage to ask her if she would. And she was so kind and willing to share her lovely voice. And I ended up telling her the story that every Christmas morning, we start out as our family by reading the light of the whole world before we have breakfast and open gifts together. And so... We're going to share that little Christmas surprise with you all right now. Sally and her team were so generous to share this recording of her reading The Light of the Whole World. Merry Christmas. The Light of the Whole World. The story of the shepherds from Luke chapter 2. That same night, in amongst the other stars, suddenly a bright new star appeared. Of all the stars in the dark vaulted heavens, this one shone clearer. It blazed in the night and made the other stars look pale beside it. God put it there when his baby son was born, to be like a spotlight, shining on him, lighting up the darkness, showing people the way to him. You see, God was like a new daddy. He couldn't keep the good news to himself. He'd been waiting all these long years for this moment, and now he wanted to tell everyone. So he pulled out all the stops. He'd sent an angel to tell Mary the good news. He'd put a special star in the sky to show where his boy was. And now he was going to send a big choir of angels to sing his happy song to the world. He's here. He's come. Go and see him, my little boy. Now. Where would you send your splendid choir? To a big concert hall, maybe? Or a palace, perhaps? God sent his to a little hillside, outside a little town, in the middle of the night. He sent all those angels to sing for a raggedy old bunch of shepherds watching their sheep outside Bethlehem. In those days, remember, people used to laugh at shepherds and say they were smelly and call them other rude names, which I can't possibly mention here. You see, people thought shepherds were nobodies, just scruffy old riffraff. But God must have thought shepherds were very important indeed, because they're the ones he chose to tell the good news to first. That night, some shepherds were out in the open fields, warming themselves by a campfire, when suddenly the sheep darted. They were frightened by something. The olive trees rustled. What, what was that? A wing beat? They turned around. Standing in front of them was a huge warrior of light, blazing in the darkness. Don't be afraid of me, the bright shining man said. I haven't come to hurt you. I've come to bring you happy news for everyone, everywhere. Today, in David's town, in Bethlehem, God's son has been born. You can go and see him. He's sleeping in a manger. Behind the angel, they saw a strange glowing cloud. Except it wasn't a cloud, it was angels, troops and troops of angels, armed with light. And they were singing a beautiful song. Glory to God, to God be fame and honour and all our hoorays. Then, as quickly as they appeared, the angels left. The shepherds stamped out their fire, left their sheep, 
raced down the grassy hill, through the gates of Bethlehem, down the narrow cobbled streets, through a courtyard, down some steps, 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 past an inn, round a corner, through a hedge, until at last they reached a tumbled down stable. They caught their breath. Then quietly, they tiptoed inside. They knelt on the dirt floor. They had heard about this promised child, and now he was here. Heaven's son, the maker of the stars, a baby sleeping in his mother's arms. This baby would be like that bright star shining in the sky that night, a light to light up the whole world, chasing away darkness, helping people to see. And the darker the night got, the brighter the star would shine. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to click the follow button in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. To learn more about our parenting resources or to see if we're coming to a city near you, visit our website at RaisingBoysAndGirls.com. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.